All right. God bless you, everyone. God bless you. This is Bishop Rowan Faulkner in Baltimore. We had some technical difficulties and we were working on it. So we are about 25 minutes behind schedule, but we thank God. Let me pray and we're going to go right into our lesson for tonight. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. Your loving kindness is better than life. Pray tonight, Lord, for everyone on this medium that's watching us around the world and here in the United States. I pray, God, something will be said tonight that will stir the hearts of your people. We pray for our pastor and bishop, Bishop Lloyd Faulkner, Pastor uh, Paulette Faulkner, and for every member of this great church. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. As I said, we had some technical difficulties here. I'm going to go right into our lesson for tonight. I'll be sharing from the book of Genesis tonight. I'll go back to the book of the beginning. Tonight I'll be speaking to you from the subject, How to Overcome Doubt. How to Overcome the Spirit of Doubt. Let me go back to the book of Genesis now. I'm just going to read a few verses, and then I'm going to move quickly into uh, teaching for tonight. All right, it says, Genesis chapter number 3, verses no, verse 1 through verse number 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of every... We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Verse number 5, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. And the woman and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to move into the lesson tonight, how to overcome doubt, the spirit of doubt. And I'll give you the brief definition and doubt as we go through this lesson tonight. By, let me begin by just saying to you tonight, I'm going to take my time, even though we're running behind, but I'm going to take my time tonight. So let me begin by saying to you, my sisters and brothers watching this broadcast around the world, wherever you are, I went back to the book of Genesis just to show you in the scriptures that doubting God is nothing new. Adam and Eve doubted what God said, and not only did they doubt God, they disobeyed God. It all started with Adam and Eve in the garden, so doubt is nothing new. God gave Adam specific instructions concerning the fruit tree. Here in verse number 16 of that chapter, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. That's what God said. Verse number 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil, Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day, in that day, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam, by his own will, chose to doubt God. God said don't eat, but he chose on purpose to disobey God and to doubt the word of God. So as I said to you that doubting is not something that started just now. We go back to the book of the beginning. Amen. God wanted Adam to obey, but God also gave Adam the freedom to choose. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand tonight, God has given each one of us the freedom to choose from the good or the bad. It's up to us to make the choice. Adam doubted God, just like many believers in the church. And I'm talking in the church, not outside of the church. I'm talking about born again believers, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost. They choose on purpose many times to doubt what God said. But if God said it, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you another scripture here. In the book of Numbers chapter 23, I'm going to rush over here to Numbers chapter 23. And I'm going to look at verse number 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. 
neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said, and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So again, the Bible said God is not like man. God cannot lie. Whenever God make a covenant promise, God is going to keep his word. But whenever we doubt God, by disobeying his word, nothing is going to change. Amen, amen. So here's what I said. Adam doubted God. His wife listened to the serpent, and he listened to his wife. We cannot afford, ladies and gentlemen listening to me tonight, you cannot afford to doubt God. The spirit of doubt comes from the enemy. It's not from God. Doubting does not come from God. It comes from the common enemy that all of us have, and that is the devil. He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to disobey God. And when you doubt the word of God, the promises of God will never come to pass in your life. God is sovereign. Hear me tonight. God is sovereign. God having supreme power. He has the authority. He has dominion over all things. Because all things are under God's control. So if God said it, ladies and gentlemen, regardless of who says what, it shall come to pass. I firmly believe that self-doubt is a sin. When we doubt God, it is a sin to doubt God. Let's look at Romans chapter 14. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures tonight. Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse, just one verse, number 23. And he that doubteth, the word ends with a TH. It means the person who continued to doubt God, the Bible says, is damned if he eat. Talking about eating things that is offered to idol. Because he eateth not of faith. He eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith, it is sin. So to doubt God is sin. To doubt God is saying to God, I don't trust you, God. I don't believe you can deliver me out of the situation that I'm in. To doubt God is, is, say, is to say to God, God, I don't believe anything you're saying. But the word of God I read earlier tonight, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Doubt is the opposite of faith. So when there is no faith, then you have the, uh, well, the devil allow you to doubt God because there's a lack of faith. It points to a lack of trust in God and God cannot equip you and enable you to do what he asks you to do. When you doubt God, it's a lack of trusting in the word of God. When you do not trust God, that is, not trust is not just a bad idea, it is a sin. Let me say that again. When we do not trust God, it is not just a bad idea. It is a sin not to trust God. So how do I overcome doubt? One, you must have the faith in the word of God. Number two, you must use the word of God that God has given to us. We have the word of God to our disposal. The word of God is there to guide you. The word of God will lead you. The word of God will give you direction. But if you don't know the word of God, you will listen to the voice of the devil. Amen. To overcome the spirit of doubt, you must use the word of God. Doubt is brought on by indecision. Hear me good tonight. I said doubt is brought on by indecision that leads to fear. And before you know it, you've taken yourself out of the game or out of the plan or the will of God. Be willing to move forward and not knowing what the end result is going to be like. If God said it, you don't have to question God, just move forward. If God said, I'm going to bless you, go to bed believing that God is going to bless you. If God said, I'm going to open a door for you, you can go to bed and go to sleep and get up next morning knowing that God will open the door. You don't have to know how God is going to do it. You don't have to know what God is doing. Just believe his word. There is a prowling force that comes from the devil that cannot, that can rob us of the joy, rob us of the confidence, and the hope sending us spiraling from a self-assured state of mind to one of worry, one of self-consciousness and uncertainty. We often don't talk much about doubt because we don't want anyone to know that we are doubting God because we've been talking so much Holy Ghost. But ladies and gentlemen, I've discovered in the many years that I've been in ministry 
that the people that doubt God the most are those that have the Holy Ghost dwelling on the inside. Well, child, I don't know if God is going to do it. I don't know. I just don't know. You don't need to know what God is going to do. Sit in God's arena and watch God turn things around for your possession. Sit in the arena of God and watch God direct your path. We often don't talk much about the spirit of doubt. As believers, we don't want others to know that we're doubting God. However, it's worth opening up a conversation on this pernicious enemy that can empower our mental faculties purely by virtue of how it influences our emotional life. Doubt will influence your emotional life, and before you know it, you're spiraling down a slope, a slippery slope, and you'll never be able to return because you listen to the voice of the devil. Ladies and gentlemen listening to me tonight, let me assure you, you cannot listen to God and listen to the devil at the same time. Are you going to trust God or trust the devil? The question is, whose report do you believe? I choose and purpose to believe the report of the Lord. If God said it, ladies and gentlemen, I said before, you can go to bed and go to sleep and rest assured that it shall come to pass. Amen, amen. Doubt, hear me good, is basically the manifestation of self-consciousness, uncertainty, and intensive questioning of the truth of God's word. You don't want to question God's word. When God makes a covenant promise with, belie with the believer, he said, I'll never leave you. God said, I'll never forsake you. The psalmist says, Yea, do I walk through the valleys and the, the shadows of death. He said, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He said, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Do you not know that God will allow your enemies to become your footstool if you trust him and do not doubt his word? You don't have to fight your enemy. God said, feed your enemy. Give them some cornbread. Give them some Akin saltfish and watch God heap a coal of fire on their head. You got to learn to trust God in the good times and in the not so good times. You've got to overcome that spirit of fear. Overcome the spirit of doubt that is trying to control your mind. Trying to control your emotions. When God make a promise, God will keep his word. God can prepare a table before us in the wilderness. The Israelites didn't believe that. Here's what they said in Psalm 78 and verse number 19. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version tonight. Don't waste your life in doubts and fears. <laughs> don't do that. Don't you waste your life in doubts and fear. You don't have to know the end from the beginning because God already knows the end from the beginning. It's not your job to know the end from the beginning. You don't have to stay up all night and, and wrestle with problems when the Bible said God never slumber nor sleep. I'll go to Genesis. I'm sorry. I'll go to Psalm 121 a little bit and show you what the word of God says. In Psalm uh, 121, here's what the word of God said. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. God will not suffer you to be in a slippery slope. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keepeth Israel will not slumber. God is not asleep. So why are you going to stay up all night turning and twisting when God is already awake? The spirit of doubt will cause you to stay up all night when God is already up taking care of situation for you. Here's what the Bible said. Behold, he that keepeth, keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. You don't have to be afraid. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me tonight. And here's what God said to Israel in Psalm 78 and verse 19. And I'm reading again from the New American Standard Version. Don't waste your life in doubts and fears. Doubting is nothing new. Jesus had to deal with doubt. He dealt with doubt. When he appeared 
to the disciples after his resurrection. And you'll find this in Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to 40. I may not read all, read all, well, let me read it. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to verse number 40. And again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. While they were telling these things, he himself, talking about Jesus, stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts, look at that, why do doubts arise in your hearts? So the spirit of doubt begins in the heart of the individual. And so you've got to keep your heart clean. Amen. Verse number 39. See my hands. Jesus said, okay, since you're doubting, look at my hands and my feet. That is, that it is I, myself. Touch me and see me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Verse number 40. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So even the disciples struggle with doubt after the resurrection of Jesus. And you'll also find this in Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17. The Bible said when they saw him, some doubted. So then as I continue tonight, and I won't be very long, we'll get you out before midnight, even though we started late. <laughs> Amen. How do I get rid of self-doubt? Good question. How do I overcome self-doubt? That has been plaguing me for so long. Sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down. I'm down. We're riding high sometimes. You're dancing in the Holy Ghost at church. And by the time you walk out, the enemy begins to sow doubt in your mind. So how do I get rid of self-doubt? Number one, start with awareness. If you're writing, write that down. To get rid of self-doubt, you must start with awareness. Know that you are dealing with a spirit. You got to know that doubting is a spirit and you're dealing with a spirit. Number two, find the source. Then you deal with the source. Whatever is causing you to doubt God, find the source and then deal with it. Number three, you got to know, rework your mind. What do I mean by that? Think of past victories and blessings. Go back and look in your life and see the times that God has blessed you and God has opened doors for you. God has made ways for you. God raised you up. God touched your body. And you've got to go back and rework your mind. Look back at your past victories when the enemy tried to cause you to think negative thoughts and to doubt God. Hear me now. Don't miss this. Write it down. If God did it once, God will do it again. Take control of your mind. Doubt begins in the mind. Feed your mind with the word of God. Remind yourself of what God is saying. If God said it, my friends, it shall come to pass. I'm going to continue. Philippians, I'm giving you a lot of scriptures tonight. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 6 to verse number 9. And again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version tonight. New American Standard Bible. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. So you got to guard your mind. You got to guard your heart with the word of God because the enemy will try to take the word from you. Amen. And if there's no word, there will be no victories. If there's no word, you will not be able to overcome. Finally, he said, my brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell or think on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. When you do the word, 
not just hear the word. James said, let's not just be hearers of the word, but let us become doers of the word. We cannot be double-minded because James said, a double-minded man is like a wave of the sea. And he said, let not that man think that he's going to receive anything from God. So in order to overcome, again, my focus tonight is how to overcome doubt. Number one, again, you must fill your heart and your mind with the word of God. You must think daily on the things of God. You must trust God in spite of what it looked like. You see, many times you look at your current situation and your current situation doesn't look good. So you begin to waver in your mind. But don't look at your current situation. Look at what God promised you in his word. My yes, my current situation doesn't look good right now. I don't know where it's going to come from. As I said earlier on, ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to know where it's coming from. If God makes a covenant promise to you, it shall come to pass. Doubt, hear me good. Doubt is that secret battle in the mind that so many believers are dealing with. And many believers, ironically, are too fearful to open up and talk about the spirit of doubt that is warring in their minds, warring in their heart. You go to bed doubting and asking the same question over and over again. Can God do it? Can God do it? My answer to you tonight is God can do it. Let's go to Ephesians. Let me show you something. Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 20. I want to read that for you so you can hear it for yourself. Ephesians again, chapter number 3. I think it is. Yes, let me flip there quickly. Uh, I'm flipping my Bible here. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. Here is what Paul said. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly. You asking if God can do it. <laughs> but here's what Paul reminding the church at Ephesus. He said now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Whatever you're, you can imagine God can do more according to the power that worketh in us. So God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can even comprehend. God can do more. Again, you're asking, you go to bed, you're tossing and turning, you're staying up late at night, worrying about situation that you have no control over. And that's exactly where the devil wants to get you. He wants you to get you to the place where you become fearful, you become doubtful, you're not trusting God. And when you don't trust God, you're telling God to his face, God, I don't believe you can bring me out. God, I don't believe you can do the impossible things that you said in your word. The Bible said with God, all things are possible. With men, it is impossible but with God, all things are possible. Yes, you must overcome the spirit of doubt by applying the word of God. When you apply the word of God, you will break down barriers and situations. Here's what I have here in my notes. Doubting is to call into question the truth of God's word. Well, my God, let me say that again. Doubting is to call into question. You want to question God. You're calling into question the truthfulness of God's word. It is also to demonstrate a lack of confidence in the promises of God. I've got to stay there for a while. Doubting is to call into question the truth of God's word. God, you said it. Well, can you do it? Can you perform your word? It is also demonst to demonstrate a lack of confidence. In other words, you do not have any confidence or any faith in the word of God when you doubt him. No confidence in God's promises. Doubt brings us to a place of fear of the unknown. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 11 and verse 23. And I'm reading now from the King James Version. This is what God said. For Jesus said this in red. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, listen, whosoever, it doesn't matter who you are. He didn't say Bishop Faulkner. He didn't say Bishop Rowan Faulkner, Bishop Lloyd Faulkner. Jesus said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed. 
and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. It's not in your head, ladies and gentlemen. Doubt is in the heart. Jesus said, if it's in the heart, then God cannot deal with you. If you do not doubt in your heart, but shall believe, you got to cancel doubt by believing. Don't allow doubt to cancel out your belief in God, but you cancel doubt by believing him. He says, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you says. Lady, what is it you've been saying? You've been, you've been speaking so much negative over your life. And that's why God cannot bless you. You don't trust God even with your, with your life. The churches are empty. We trust God that he can keep us when we go to the restaurant. God can keep you when you go to the mall. Oh, and those of you that work in, 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 in the medical field, God can keep you in the hospital. Where, but you don't believe God can keep you if you come back to the church. You don't trust God even to come to church. Because you doubt the word of God. And in verse number 24 of Luke, I'm sorry, Mark 11 verse 24, Jesus continued by saying, if you ask anything, you know what, let me read it just like it is in the word. I'm, I'm turning to the side, I need to look at you. Mark chapter 11 again, and, and let me go to uh, verse number 24. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 11 24. Let me read it, I'm flipping. Here's what Jesus said. Therefore I say unto you, what to in, what sort of things you desire when you pray, the moment you pray, Jesus said, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. But you're not getting it because you're not believing. You allow the enemy, the spirit of doubt to control your minds, control your emotions. And so you're, you're fluctuating. Let me use another word. You're vacillating. One minute you're believing and then the next minute you say, I don't know if God can do it. Will God be able to prepare a table in the wilderness? That's what Israel said for us. They saw the hand of God before. God fed them with manna. God opened the Red Sea for them. What kind of Red Sea are you dealing with tonight? Do you not know that God can allow you to cross over if you trust him tonight? Do you trust God enough to go back to church? Do you trust, you know, some of you listening to me, you don't even trust God with your money. And that's why we have so many. I'm not talking about you, so don't get upset with me. I'm not trying to raise an offering tonight. Many believers are God robbers. They're not tithers. They don't believe that if they give God a, a dime out of the dollar, that they can make it with 90 cents. So you're telling God to his face. And my wife taught that lesson before, that he doesn't worth even a dime. We shout, we dance. But yet we won't give an offering to ministry. We wear the best hats. We wear the best dress. But we fail to trust God enough to pay tithe to the ministry. Yes, I said it. I hope Bishop don't invite you back again. He's my brother. He might. <clears throat> Let me continue, ladies and gentlemen. You can't have faith and doubt God at the same time. Hear me. You cannot have faith in God and doubt him at the same time. It will not work. If I should turn the light switches off right now, this room where I am in studio, I'm in studio 1A, it will become dark. The moment I flip the switch, darkness will take over this room. But the moment I flip the switch again in the on position, the darkness has to go because darkness and light cannot remain in the same room at the same time at the same degree. Lord have mercy help us tonight. You cannot say you trust God and doubt God at the same time. It will not work. You must hear me now. You must really believe it that God will do it for you. It will happen for you if you do not doubt in your heart. The kind of prayer that moves mountains is the prayer of faith. You cannot pray and then underscore your underscore, S-C-O-R-E, your prayer 
by saying that I don't know if it's going to work. The moment you pray, a prevailing prayer, just believe that it's going to come to pass. When? God will make it happen. <laughs> I said God will make it happen, but you got to trust your prayer that when you ask anything in my name, he said, I'll do it. It's in your Bible, John, I think chapter 14 and 13. If you ask anything in my name, well, you know what? Let me go to the Bible. Let me go to the Bible. Let me go to the Bible. I'm going over here to John chapter. Hold up. Hold, hold your horse there. Hold your horse. John chapter. Um, John chapter 14. And let me begin reading at verse 13 and verse 14. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'm in John chapter 14, and I'm just reading 13, and let me go to 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Not maybe, Jesus said, I will do it. Jesus said, I will do it for you. But you allow doubt to creep in and say, oh, I'm praying and I don't know. Abraham believed God, the Bible said, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, and Abraham did not have the Holy Ghost. God made a covenant promise to Abraham. He was 75 years old and the promise came to fulfillment. 25 years later, a son was born to him and Sarah, even though Sarah laughed when God promised that nation shall come out of your loins. Sarah laughed and she tried to help out God by sending Hagar into Abraham. And she conceived and bear a son by the name of Ishmael. And those are the nations, Arab nations that are fighting against the Israeli now. You don't need to help God out. If God said it, it shall come to pass. Let me hasten on here because I'm trying to finish this. It would seem impossible to move a mountain into the sea. I just read it earlier on. So Jesus used that illust illustration to show you. <laughs> that God can do the impossible if you do not doubt in your heart. You must be you must be a believer and not a doubter. Matthew fourteen verse thirty and thirty one. Read those scriptures. But when you saw, but when talking about Peter, but when he saw the wind boisterous and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, "Lord, save me!" And immediately Jesus stretched forth the hands his hand. And caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, as long as Peter believed that he could step out of the boat and went to Jesus, everything was all right. But a moment he saw the wind boisterous. He didn't believe that Jesus was able to take care of the wind. Although we start out with good intentions sometimes, our faith falters because of doubt and fear. The Bible says when Peter saw the winds, wind boisterous strong, the word boisterous means strong, he was afraid and began to sink. When Peter's faith faltered, he reached out to Jesus. You need to reach out to Jesus tonight. Are you hearing me? The only one who can help you, the only one who can deliver you, the only one who can make a way for you. Don't allow the spirit of doubt to control your mind and your heart. He was afraid, but he still looked to Christ. I'm going to hasten on, I have a few more verses here, pages rather, not much. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. When you are apprehensive about the troubles around you, and doubt Christ's presence or his ability to help you. Remember that he always with you. And he's, he's the only one that can help you. You know, people make a lot of promises. What they're going to do for you. And how they're going to help you. And when they, the time comes for them to do it, they say, I can't help you. But whatever God promised you in his word, I want you to go to bed tonight. I want you to get rid of the spirit of doubt tonight. I want you to begin to apply the word of God to your faith tonight. Apply the word of God to your life tonight. And I guarantee you, your situation is going to change. Oh yes, it will. I know in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that God is able tonight. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly. You got to believe that word tonight. He's always with you. 
He's the only one who can really help you. When you doubt God, you are simply telling God or telling him, you don't, I don't trust you, God. When you doubt him, you're telling him, I don't trust you. Jesus asked Peter a very important question. Why did you doubt me? We just read the scripture in Matthew 14. Then Jesus asked him, why did you doubt me? He's asking us tonight the same question. Few Tim and wherever you're watching me from around the world tonight, the question is, why are you doubting God? You're not receiving the promises because you're doubting God. The promises of God will not come into your life because you're doubting his word. But when you trust the word of God, when you trust God and his ability to perform his word, I think Jeremiah said God is going to hasten. He hastened to perform his word. God will do it, ladies and gentlemen. The question is again tonight, why are you doubting me? That's what Jesus is saying to us tonight. As I close out tonight, again, why are you doubting me? Why are you complaining so much? There are folk that complain about everything. I said there are folk that complain about everything. They don't trust God. We only trust God in the things that we can see. But if you can see the thing, you don't need to trust God for it. Because it's in your hand. You trust God when you don't know where it's coming from. Again, let me go back to the church again. Come back to my spirit again. We go where we want to go. Except the church now. I saw this uh, thing recently where this gentleman was showing a, I think it was a stadium somewhere in the, in the south with 70,000 people jammed and packed. No mass. Then he showed a shopping mall jammed and packed with folk going to and fro. Then he showed an airplane packed with folk. But every one of those in the airplane, they had a mask on. Then he showed the church building with about three or four people in there. When are you going back to the church? You believe God can protect you when you travel to see your family. You travel in the plane, you go to the mall, you go to the, the restaurant, you go here. But no, he can't keep you in the church. Oh, I'm, child, I'm going to get something in church. The devil is a liar. Even the disciples doubted when they saw Jesus. The Bible says some of them believe and some doubted. You'll find this in Matthew chapter number 28, verse 16 and 17. Verse 17 says, and when they saw him, this was after his resurrection. They were with him for many, many moons, if I may say. They were with him to his ministry, but now they doubted that he was risen from the dead. And when they saw him now, they worship him. He said, but some of them doubt it. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we have a chap in the Bible, a young man in the Bible. Not young man, I'm just using that terminology. By the name of Thomas. You'll find this in John chapter 20, my last scripture tonight. John chapter 20, 24 to 29. Let me read it because we always jump with hands and feet on Thomas. And many of you listening to me, you're no better off than Thomas. Here's what the Bible said about Thomas. In John chapter 20, verse 24. And I think I'll try to close out on that. Maybe I'll try to do my best to close out with that last scripture here. So here's what the Bible said. But Thomas. Now this was after the resurrection of Jesus. One of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came back. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. And then put my finger into the print of the nails. And trust my hand, thrust my hand into his side. He said, I will not believe. Many of you are looking for signs and wonders before you believe. You believe and signs and wonders will follow. I said, signs and wonders will follow when you believe. So here's verse number 25. The other disciples said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, except I see the prince of the nails and put my finger in. Verse number 26 now. The Bible said, and after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut, man. He walked in. This was after his resurrection. The doors being shut and stood in the midst of them and said, peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, because he knew the heart of Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Who am I talking tonight? You're faithless. That's why you don't do anything for the ministry. You're faithless. That's why you won't come to church. 
But I want you to change your faithless to faithfulness, to become faithful, to become a strong believer, overcome that fear factor in your life by applying the word of God. When you apply the word of God, there is no substitute, my friends, for the word of God. Bible said the word is quick, powerful. I think in, in Acts chapter 12, I think somewhere it says the word is quick. The word is powerful. The word is sharper than any twisted sword. You got to apply the word. You got to trust the word. You got to believe that word. Finally, verse number 29. And I close on that. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed, which also means happy, are they that have not seen me. And yet have believed. For those of you that are listening to me tonight. I hope you've been blessed. Start believing tonight. Begin to rethink. The way you've been thinking. You got to get out of the. Comfort zone you're in. You got to change your whole mindset. Your life will be a direct result. Of what you've been believing. And what you've been confessing over your life. If you get up every day and confess. How bad things are. Things will never change. You may, yes, you may feel a little sick sometimes, but every day you get, Lord, child, I'm so sick. I, I'm sick like a dog. I don't know what it means to be sick like a dog because I'm not a dog. But I've heard folk, I've heard saints say, I'm sick like a dog. The devil is a liar. You confess that you're sick, you'll continue. Yes, we're not lying. You are, but you got to confess by his stripes, I'm healed. The Bible said he sent his word and healed. So even though you're not feeling, well, get up and begin to thank God for your healing. That is faith in action. Trust God. In spite of what it looked like. I don't have any money. But I know I'm not going to bed hungry. Because God is going to send somebody. From somewhere. To bless my socks off. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. You got to believe his word tonight. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching us tonight. I hope something I've been said. Has been a blessing to you tonight. Overcoming doubt again. That was the that was the focus tonight. Overcoming one, you must learn to believe the word of God. You must learn to trust God. You must accept the word. You must accept that word. Malachi chapter 3, I said was the last scripture, but I got to throw this one in in my closing. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to repeat it. Malachi, the third chapter, verse number 6. He said, I am God, and I change not. Therefore, the sons of Jacob are not consumed. He is God. He's not going to change. God will not change his mind. God will not change his plan. He said forever. That word is settled. It is sealed. His word will accomplish. His word will bring deliverance. His word will bring healing. Stop saying well you know child. I'm a, I think I'm. No no get up and say I'm alive and well. Stop talking crazy and negative. I don't know if I'm going to, you'll never make, get up and say, I'm going to make it. If I go, say, I'm going to go in Jesus name. You got to trust him. I'm blessed tonight. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Let me pray for you tonight. Wherever you're watching from tonight, I want you to trust God. I want you to believe his word. If you ever was a doubter, change your mindset tonight and start being a believer. Start trusting God. Don't be like the fellow we accused Thomas of doubting. But many of you listening to me tonight, maybe you're no better off than Thomas. But when Thomas saw, he said, oh, my Lord and my God, Jesus said, fellow, look, you know, just because you see me believe, blessed or happy are those that have not seen me, but yet they believe. I want you to believe God tonight. My question is to you tonight. What have you been praying for that you have not yet received? Don't quit. Don't give up and say, I don't know what's going to happen. I prayed for things now. Things 20 plus years ago, it's coming to pass now. Abraham believed God. That's what the Bible said. God promised him that a son would come out of his loins at 75 years old. And 25 years later, and Abraham did not have the Holy Ghost. You have the Holy Ghost. Why aren't you believing God tonight? Let me pray. Let me pray. Thank God for feeding him tonight. Praise God for my brother, Bishop Lloyd Faulkner, and co-pastor Paulette Patricia Faulkner. We thank God for you tonight and the work you're doing there in New Jersey, that God will continue to bless you and give you favor. The favor of God is upon this ministry. you got to believe it. Every member of 
a few of them tonight watching me, the favor of God will be upon, the, upon your life when you follow your leader because the blessing flows down. You can't get behind, you can't get ahead of your leader. You got to work with your leader and watch God turn your life around. So Father, we thank you tonight for your grace. We thank you for the words we heard tonight. You have said it, Lord. Blessed are those who will believe you without seeing tonight. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice tonight. Their faith will be increased, Lord. Increase their faith. Take them to a whole new level, another dimension of faith in you, Lord. God, help them to trust you tonight, to believe your word, because your word cannot return void, but your word will accomplish where unto it is sent. I pray the blessings of Almighty God upon each one tonight, and especially on the pastor and co-pastor. Lord, you'll strengthen their resolve, strengthen their faith even more, Lord. Keep them covered under the blood. In the name of Jesus Christ and for those that are working with them, I pray that the hand of God will be upon you. He will strengthen you. He will bless you tonight. He will keep you. He will preserve you in the name of Jesus. And I decree and declare tonight that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You overcome by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. The Lord bless you tonight. And as Paul, I'm sorry, as... um. The Aaronic priesthood said, uh, as he blessed the children of Israel, he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace tonight. You'll rest in peace as you trust his word and believe his word. And everything you desire shall come to pass. Paul, in his writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, Paul said to the Corinthians, for we walk by faith. And not by sight. God bless you tonight. Love you. I'm gone.